thank you, thank you, Jan, and I, I want to thank Martin as well for giving credit to the HIV community for whatever has been achieved in patient advocacy. And I want to thank also you, Patty, for making this happen, I mean that I'm here today. Um, but you know what, I'm also a group therapist and I just hate seeing people sitting around in rooms. So let's start with a short play. It's not gonna hurt and you are not going to be exposed, but I want you to stand up and please come forward into this front part of the room now. You have like 20 seconds for doing that, please. And I get ready in the meantime. So look, I'm gonna have some, some really, really very simple basic questions for you, which is, um, which is really very easy. And I will ask you to position yourselves in the room according to whatever, whatever I ask from you. It's not, it really is very simple. So, if you like, and there, you have to choose, there's no in-between, okay? So if you like bubbly water, bubbly water with gas, please stand in that side of the room. And if you like plain water, no bubbles, please stand on this side of the room. That's the side with gas, this is the side without gas. No, I don't like you. All right, so um, just look around. Who's, uh, who's standing there? I'm, I have the next question. Watch. If you are afraid of the dentist, then you stand on this side of the room. If you think that the dentist is your friend and you're not afraid of the dentist, then you stand on that side of the room. <laughs> Is it okay, thank you. Okay, so look around once again. Which group is which group is bigger? Apparently, people who are not afraid of the dentist are more. Congratulations. Actually, I should be standing on this side of the room. Um, so my next question is: If you feel relaxed and easy about this afternoon or whatever is going to happen, then please stand on that side of the room. If you're slightly apprehensive and nervous, then please stand on this side of the room. So this is easy and relaxed. I was easy this is me. nervous. No, I will, I will be, I will show solidarity and stand with you on this side, on the nervous side, okay? So, all right. Now my next question will be, and it's, it's getting a little trickier now. If you are working with patients directly, if you do any kind of direct advocacy work with patients, then please stand on that side of the room. If you work in the CML field or in any, in, in any other disease area, but you don't work directly with patients, then please stand on this side of the room. If you're a patient yourself, that of course counts like working with patients. So then you stand on this side of the room. <laughs> Good. All right. Excellent. Yes, you bro exactly, exactly. Um, now, and I have a last one, and this is about, but you see, really, what is majority and what is minority really just depends on what questions you ask, right? Now, my next um, uh, thing or my next question will be, if you are a patient in any regard or in any sense of the word, 
So if you're a patient, whatever that means to you, if you consider yourself a patient, please stand on this side of the room. If you're not a patient in any context, then please stand on that side of the room. Okay, so you see it's not so clear cut, right? But my next question is, if you think of yourself as a healthy person, then please stand on this side of the room. If you think of yourself as a person living with any kind of illness or disease, please stand on this side of the room. If you think you're ill, you stand on this side. If you think you're healthy, you stand on that side. Jan, you're not sure. Stand in the middle. <laughs> you have to decide. No, you can't choose the middle. You have to make a decision now. But do you realize that being a patient and being ill or being healthy are not the same thing? So, um, Let's play another game. I just wanted to sensitize you to the fact that it really just depends on the question what I ask. Can I, I need a chair. This is gonna be another game. This chair here, and we will use the stage for this. This chair here is the patient, okay? It's pretty easy. I want, I need three volunteers, three volunteers, it's not gonna hurt, who will play for the next five, 10 minutes, the treatment. Who's, who's ready to play the treatment? I need three people, because it's a complex treatment. Come forward. We have two. Okay, we have three people, excellent. Now, you know what, I want to ask you to please place yourselves um, in a remote end of the room. You're the treatment, okay? And just whichever corner that you prefer, which is far from the patient. It's important that you're far from the patient. Now, I want to ask the rest of you who are, um, who are, um, you, can, you can be together or you can be separately, that's fine. That's absolutely okay, yeah. So there's treatment, here's the patient. Now I, I want you to think, contemplate a little bit about what obstacles, what hindrances are there that prevent the treatment from getting into the patient? What is there in your experience from the CML field or any other field that you think prevent treatment from getting into the patient? So the objective is to get treatment into the patient, right? There's treatment out there. Here's the patient. What are the obstacles? It's too expensive. It's too expensive. So will you be, will you be willing to play too expensive for the next five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> or anyone else? Okay. Come up. What else? Someone said access. Was that you, Jura? Can you play access for the next five minutes? Side effects, okay. In what way is side effects a problem? Because the patient with the side effects don't, uh, give, uh, don't take the, took the, the, the drug. The patient resists because of the side effects. Yes. Can you play side effects? Thank you. Yes? Patients don't aware that there is treatment. Patients don't know that there is treatment. Excellent, so there's, there is a, a certain level of ignorance on the side of the patients concerning treatment. Come up. What else? Go ahead. Sorry? Government, policy, policy, politics, come up. You should actually be a much larger person than this. <laughs> in fact, that's my experience, at least in the HIV field, that it's a 
big problem. Uh, it's Greg. It's Greg. <laughs> so, what else? What else is there that you think will prevent treatment from getting into the patient? Sorry, I can, can hear you. Yes. Uh, cultural values, people who don't believe in uh, conventional medication. That's very important, cultural values. We have a lot of that in the HIV field, yes. People don't take medication for cultural reasons, for religious reasons. That's an important point. And psychological issues. And psychological issues as well. Come up. I love doing it. Yes. <laughs> Is, uh, is, there <laughs> is there anything else, or do you think that this, uh, this uh, acu uh, accurately represents the obstacles to getting treatment into the patient? Do you think that this is um, more or less what's there? What else? People live in countryside, having no approach yeah. to the doctors. So this is, this is an access issue, isn't it? Okay, come up. Now, I want you, uh, that probably we could probably think up more and more, but what I want you to do, because you are getting so many, I, what I want you to do is to please try to actively prevent this patient from getting treatment, right? So I don't know how you do that. You're probably creative enough for that. Try to protect the patient from receiving treatment because you are the obstacles. Let me see how you do that. <laughs> Are you killing the patient now? <laughs> so, um, try to, I mean, really, seriously, with your bodies physically, try to, you know, I would suggest just stand around the chair or do something that makes it difficult for the treatment to get into the patient. Go ahead. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm staying like this to the uh, patient as a government, I don't want to uh, pay the um, generic uh, ones mm -hmm. uh, because there is a uh, generic and the other ones, the original ones. Yes. Yes. Uh, now in, in my country, we have to pay for the original ones. Uh, the government only uh, give us the generic yes. ones, not the original ones. Mm -hmm. So. So that's why you turn your back to the patient because you don't care. You just care about the money, or the. Yeah. Okay. Right. Everybody else, how, how do you position yourselves around the patient so that you prevent? Yes. Yes. I'll provide. This is a patient who is living in the countryside, yes. and he has no means to approach the doctors or the, to, the treatments. Mm -hmm. I will provide him the transports and assure him that uh, all the means of transportation would be borne by me. Let's come for the treatment. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, but you stay here because you're, an you are still an obstacle. You are still an obstacle. Okay, so can you, can you just, because it's very easy for the treatment to get to the patient there, for example, right? So, yeah, you can, you can also destabilize the patient like that. And, uh, right, now. That's, that's actually, that's what's happening, yes. For some reason, they don't do it, but that's actually what that's, yes. Now it's, it's shaping up, it's shaping up now. Now you, the rest of the people, you guys, what do you do? What kind of resources, what kind of um, forces, helpers, do you have to get the treatment across all these obstacles into the patient? What is it that you can do? so that you can get rid of these obstacles and get the treatment which is out there far away into the patient. Sorry? Empower the patient, how do you do that? So you provide information and education. Which of the, which of the obstacles would you target? Come on. So just position yourself somewhere, right? <laughs> there, that's, that's, that's exactly what's happening, right? So this is, I can see. What else? What else do you need in order to get the treatment into the patient? Don't help here. <laughs> <laughs> what else do you need? <laughs> you need a lot of money. Yes, yes of course. A lot of funding. A lot of funding. So where do you, but where do you position yourself as money? As money, we're doing 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay, how do you do that? Because the treatment is still out there. Yeah. Well, you have to actually go to government. Yeah. Break down, you know, get the government laws changed so that we can get it approved. And Come on, play the part. What else? What else do you need? Or what else do you do in order to facilitate? Go ahead. I'm a treatment, but in this case, I would invite this guy's media and blame the government for forgetting uh, the, the patient's rights. All right, so you would use media as well. Yeah. That's, very, that's a very wise idea. Come up here and just, and sh I mean, sorry? I am a treatment oh, in you're this a case, treatment, I just Will proposed. someone please play? media involvement instead of treatment <laughs> you can oh you can do that that's that's lovely excellent yes exactly there you are so you are already teaming up together and here's the media helping as well let me tell you we still have this little problem that the treatment shh, no physical violence please <laughs> No, 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 no. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Because we don't have, we don't have everything yet, so hold it. It's um, also no, no violence, no tickling. Tickling is also violence, so no tickling. It's, um, look, yeah, go ahead. All oh, right, that's a very good idea. So you would you would introduce some other communication um, targets in order to divert attention. Okay, that's a good idea. Yes. Or try that some politics person uh, will uh, have same mm -hmm. and then all things will change. <laughs> so you are talking you're talking about communication, in fact. So you you would use communication tools in order to get treatment easier yes that's true yeah yeah of course of course yeah so this is lobbying but it's also about communication isn't it it's a very good example because actually what happened in the Ukraine, I don't know whether you know that, but this is how um, HIV treatment became widely available in the Ukraine. That yes, there were politicians and relatives of politicians who suddenly got diagnosed with HIV and then treatment became available. So this is, um, you're very right, that's, that's a good strategy. Has someone, oh you are there, that's good. Um, <laughs> I still have a slight issue with treatment being at the far end of the room. When you, when you, in the context of treatment, not only are you talking about the, the treatment drugs, but you're talking about the physicians that treat it, right? Right. Okay. So what we do is we bring it together and bring them on the stage. Do it! <laughs> What prevents, what prevents you from doing it? Let's go. <laughs> Let's go for it. Oh. All right, so there comes, just watch out, watch out people, there comes treatment and wants to get into the patient. Where is the government? <laughs> just be careful, be careful that you don't fall off the, that you don't fall off the stage, right? We bring the leading specialists, we bring the leading specialists to the community. And it's only a, you know, be quiet, you disturbances, psycho. No. So through, through programs in our local communities, we bring the professionals, the treatment professionals, to the pi population in order to educate them on the, be quiet, you distractors of treatment, be quiet. Um, but we bring the professionals, the doctors, the leading specialists to the community where the patients are mm -hmm. so that they have easier access to ask the questions they need, educate themselves, and then disperse that information among themselves to help at least 
you know, know what the treatments are and what is available. Right, it's, but actually, do you realize what happened? What did you just do? You did not just explain what you do, but you also sli silenced all of these people, right? So community actually does have this power to speak up and silence the noise and focus on the issue and get treatment. Oh, are you sitting comfortably? <laughs> and get treatment into the patient. So it happened, right? The treatment is there. And, it's, and even if it's just a short... Sorry. Even if it's just a short exposure to the leading opinion, lead, the, the opinion leaders and those that are in the know about treating the disease, a lot of the information that they have can translate quickly when there's that close connection, that touch, that direct speaking. Whereas, you know, we have many ways to do that electronically, but we can physically bring them. It's easier to bring one to the masses than to take the masses to one. So there's a variety of ways that we can do that. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, about what concrete ways there are, this is something that we will talk about shortly um, during my presentation. But I just wanted to demonstrate to you that it's, um, if you think about the whole field, if you think about the context, if you think about what you do, as, um, as treatment advocates or as patient advocates, then try to think about these very practical images. What is, what is actually happening? So there is a person in need, and you as patient advocates or as treatment advocates need to do something in order to help that person in need. And it often really does help if you try to visualize what the context is, what the actual obstacles are, and what your resources are in order to overcome those obstacles. Um, we could go on with this actually for hours. Usually this is a three-day training <laughs> program which I do, but, uh, but we will stop here if that's all right with you. And I would like to ask you to get yourselves out of your rows and, <laughs> and, uh, and please be seated. And now comes the boring part. So, um, what I can, can I still keep this because I'm thank you. Um, I will. I, I would like to f first of all encourage you to um, ask questions anytime. So you you feel please feel free to interrupt me anytime when you think that there's something that you don't understand or that you disagree with or that you want to ask or whatever. Um, so let's begin very shortly with the, with the European AIDS Treatment Group. The European AIDS Treatment Group was established 21 years ago in Berlin, Germany. It's a pan-European network of um, people living with HIV, activists. It's not an umbrella organization of, um, of other HIV organizations, but it's a network of individuals living across Europe. Europe in this, um, or, or at, at this point means WHO Europe, so it's 53 countries now, used to be 52. Um, and um, we have members from almost all of these uh, countries. Now, the European AIDS Treatment Group has one mission, which is um, helping the daily lives of people living with HIV. And we do this through three main activity areas or three main pillars of our work, which is science, policy, and training. And I will talk very shortly about all uh, three, and then I will speak specifically about the science part. So um, policy work is sounds pretty straightforward. Policy work means lobbying and representing the political interests of people living with HIV within Europe. Um, on the level of, um, of Europe, so with the European Commission and the European Parliament, but also on the level of national parliaments and, um, and other national authorities. Obviously, 
almost all of our members also represent not just themselves, but they also represent to a certain extent their national HIV organizations. Some of them just one organization, some of them several. Um, so they can also do lobbying on national level, and then we also do this um, centrally, so to say, from our uh, offices in, or office rather, just one, in Brussels. So it's a German organi organization which works in Brussels. Uh, training is also pretty obvious, I think. So we organize training for ourselves internally, for activists, when we talk about how to do activism, and also we talk about how to do scientific work and contribution to research, which is something that I will talk about more in detail. Um, and um, we also organize training externally. Like this, for example, when I'm here, this is going to go into our training report. Um, or we organize several day long trainings for um, activists in other countries of Europe where perhaps activism is not so well developed. Um, and then we go there and we try to tell people how to do it or how we think it, uh, it, is, it is doable or how it can work. So why we do this, this is pretty obvious. This is our mission to improve, to help the daily lives of, of people living with, um, with HIV. And there is one key point through which we have been trying to achieve this and which is very important and can be of relevance uh, to you too, and this is our scientific work. The ATG has a special um, work group which is called the European Community Advisory Board, uh, or the abbreviation is ECAB. And ECAB is a collection, is a group of um, expert patients. I don't know whether you are familiar with the term expert patient as described by two gentlemen, Kilman and Cataldo. Do you know the term expert patient? So expert patient is a person living with a disease. Living with a disease in this case also means that not necessarily him or herself has that particular disease, but someone in the family or close in the close environment, the point is that it's a lake person, so it's not a doctor or not a nurse, but a simple individual who becomes an expert in that particular disease. You probably are expert patients, you just don't know, I mean those of you who live with CML uh, or next to CML, but you know, don't necessarily think about yourselves as expert patients in this, in this uh, technical term. So um, the ECAB, the European Community Advisory Board, what it does is um, it interacts on a regular basis. It has been around for 15 years now. It interacts on a regular basis with pharmaceutical manufacturers working in the field of HIV and AIDS, and also with researchers, universities and research institutions and with governments, with states, focusing specifically on, um, on uh, the scientific aspects of treatment. This would be side effects, this would be um, how you take the treatment, uh, this would be quality of life. Also, I mean, every, every single area that, that, uh, that you can think of and that can be scientifically approached or is scientifically approached is within the remit of the European Community Advisory Board. What I am supposed to talk about uh, now is partly how to devise an advocacy strategy. But what I want to point out while talking about that is why we believe that a Community Advisory Board is a workable tool, is a useful tool in order to become better and more effective, more efficient um, activists and advocates for patient interests. Um, so the working model is pretty simple. The, um, the, the European Community Advisory Board, which is part of the European um, uh, AIDS Treatment Group, so it's a working group of the ATG, um, is um, partly, partly, not entirely, but partly financed by the pharmaceutical companies. Pharmaceutical companies, because it's an advisory board, pay a certain fee in order to come to attend meetings with the European Community Advisory Board, where they come and present their ongoing research, their pipelines, and expert patients sitting, it's usually 
20 to 25 people sitting around the table. We'll listen to them, we'll listen to the pharmaceutical company representatives. These are always researchers, never the marketing people. We don't accept marketing people. It's the researchers, the scientists. We listen to them and we review and criticize their research. Do you do that in the CML field? Does this happen? So, I mean, a simple way is raise your hand if it does. If you do this kind of work, then raise your hand. My question is why not? <laughs> it is doable. It's, it's, a very, it's a very important point that it is something that can be done. What we do there is we represent the patient's perspective. So, you know, for scientists and for, for doctors and especially for pharmaceutical companies, and I will try not to sound hostile, it is very easy to imagine the ideal patient. I don't know how it is in CML, but in HIV, the ideal patient is white, middle-aged, is, is a white, middle-aged gay man who doesn't have sex ever, doesn't smoke, doesn't drink alcohol at all, never takes drugs, is about, let's say, 35 to 40 years, does sport five times a week, and uh, never forgets to take his medication. That's the ideal patient. Do you live a life like that? It's, so one of our key missions is to represent the real patient, because the real patient does get drunk, forgets his drugs or her drugs, um, stays out for a night, has <laughs> lucky, or if he or she is lucky, has several sex partners a year and doesn't necessarily live in a happy marriage, or if he or she does live in a happy marriage, then maybe he or she has other issues which will prevent him or her from being the ideal patient. So one of our key objectives is to represent the patient perspective in that we also speak up for people who are underprivileged yet remain key affected populations for, for HIV. You know, HIV is a complicated thing because um, it's very stigmatized. HIV is um, associated with um, drug use, with homosexuality, with uh, sex work, um, especially intravenous injecting drug use, which is again something not so sexy to talk about. Um, so it is, it is very heavily stigmatized and therefore it is essential that those underprivileged populations are also represented. Um, so, but there are also certain shortcomings to this, uh, to this model, and one is um, our strong dependency on pharmaceutical company money. Um, now, why do you think this is an issue? Are there Italians in the room? We say there are no free meals. So when you get something, you are expected to give back, and that's a problem. There is this Italian saying which says, chi paga comanda. So who pays orders the music. And it's, um, it is, while it's absolutely essential for a patient organization like ECAB or like a community advisory board that you guys might set up, that you set the agenda. So we insist on setting the agenda. It's not the pharmaceutical companies who come and say what they want to talk about. It's us saying what we want to talk, to talk about. How can you achieve that? That's a, that's a good question. What do you think, what can be the ways to achieve that? Can you please turn on your microphone? Unrestricted um, grants from pharma where you receive minimal funding but you fundraise the bulk, it's what our organization does, you fundraise the bulk of your funds yourself and pharma are key stakeholders in a certain aspect so it's important to include them. Yep. But in a way where any funding that you do get is an unrestricted grant so you're not infiltrated by pharma and you make decisions solely based on advocacy and the best interests of the people that you're... Um, your organization stands for. Right, so you have to lobby for, I mean, with the pharmaceutical companies to get unrestricted funding in order to make sure that they cannot intervene uh, in your work. But I suggest another solution, which is not very different from this, but still it's slightly different, 
which is improving your knowledge and showing that you know best. Because in that case, you simply become unavoidable. And this is exactly what happened with ECAB and with what happened with, uh, I mean, within, the, uh, within the HIV field. Because there was such political pressure pushing back um, uh, pe people living with HIV because of stigma and because all of these you know, moral issues around HIV, that there was this anger building up within the community. And this anger became then actually the engine of the HIV movement back in the 80s. And that anger could be then slowly, gradually transformed into knowledge and activism. So one of the ways of, uh, of moving forward is educating yourselves, but that's exactly what you're doing right here. And this is exactly what we are also doing within the European Community Advisory Board in a very conscious way. So we will reach out to our members and also do it for ourselves and actively do support work in order to learn more about our own disease and learn more about um, uh, HIV and whatever is out there, what, others, what, what scientists um, uh, do. Hello. So what we say that it is your body, so you should know best. You know, one of the most common side effects, and I don't know about your disease, but one of the most common side effects with HIV medication is uh, diarrhea. Do you know the, um, how diarrhea is graded when we talk about side effects? It's not a nice topic, but let's face it, it's just there. So if you have like grade two diarrhea, do you know what that means? Grade two diarrhea, it doesn't even show up in the dehydration. Terms. Sorry, dehydration. No, no, no. I mean, how how many times do you have to use the toilet if you have grade two diarrhea? Six, six to eight times. Have you ever tried to live like that? And grade two diarrhea doesn't even show up in the reports. It's like, right? For the doctors, I mean, not for me. <laughs> so it's. Um, and that's why it's very important that you, you know, that you have to say no, no. It's not, I mean, it's, it's a debilitating thing if you have to use the toilet like every two hours. So it's your body, and then this means that you also probably know best how you live in your body. So information is key, and it is empowerment, as I already uh, said. You have to work along joint interests, but this is so obvious that I will not even go into detail. And what I want to explain to you is how we believe that from a patient, you become an expert patient, and then you also become a conscious consumer. Don't forget that you are taxpayers. So whatever the um, social security systems pay, that comes from partly from your money as well. So it's not like a favor by the state. And through that, you also become a more empowered citizen. And we also believe that expert patients this way are multipliers of knowledge. So you probably also disseminate whatever knowledge you gather here or collect here through your blogs and your websites um, to other patients and, and to the general public as well. Uh, expert patients are also multipliers of coping strategies because we also know that one of the ways how you can cope with a chronic disease is to become an expert patient because it reduces your anxiety level if you know more about what is going on in your body. And also, um, expert patients are multipliers of empowerment because you talk to other patients and you explain to them that they should not be so afraid. It's not so bad, well, look at me. I have been around with HIV for more than 11 years. You can live with HIV, you will, you remain able-bodied. It is, it is not the end of the world. For many people, when they get their diagnosis, and it's probably the same with CML as well, when they get their diagnosis, it's like the end of the world. And in a certain sense, it is. It is the end of that world that they used to live in so far, but on the other hand, life does go on, and you as an expert patient can set a living, a, a living example to how life can go on. Of course, not everybody will become an expert patient, but that doesn't matter. So just to see a little bit of, um, of uh, theory, there is, um, it's not so important, so just two minutes, 
Um, there are two gentlemen uh, called uh, Leidersdorf and uh, Zodi who um, invented the uh, knowledge sociological theoretical framework of the triple helix. The triple helix is composed of um, academia, industry, and regulators, which is the state. And they say, Leidersdorf uh, particularly, that through the interaction of these three uh, actors, um, in, the, in the field where these three actors interact, that's where innovation happens. And what we say that this um, um, process doesn't happen or cannot and should not happen without civil society involvement, which in this case is the expert patients, which in this case is the patient community. So that it should be integrated into this quadruple helix. And if you're more interested in this theoretical stuff, then read my paper. The uh, link is at the end uh, of my presentation. Let's look at, uh, a little bit at how um, the EATG is structured and how this work is going on. Um, this is one model which has proven workable and to a certain extent successful. It's not necessarily so that you will be able or it will be necessary for you to work along the same model, but something similar might also prove useful for, for, for you or for your organizations. Uh, and also don't forget that this structure has been built up uh, over a span of 20 years. So it did not and it will never happen from one day to the next. So if you look at this, then we are in, in, um, in uh, so we have an office which sits in Brussels. In the office, we also have um, officers who, who work uh, or cover certain areas. We have a policy officer who works on, uh, on policy issues. We have a scientific officer who works um, on, on uh, I mean, keeps contact with uh, pharmaceutical companies and works on scientific issues. Um, we also have a training officer who organizes all the, the different training courses that we go to um, and uh, moves around this network of activists. Um, and, um, and also we have logistical staff and, um, I mean, people who just take care of, you know, flights and stuff. Um, not that it's not important, but, um, but they don't do policy or, or, or scientific work. And because it's a network of activists, we, we, we don't get paid for our work. So we work for free, which is, which sounds very cool and sexy, but it is a problem because you can use activists only up to a certain time and only up to a certain extent. Do you also have this experience with fatigue, that activists just become fatigued? They wear out and they just, you know, they stop working. Usually we say that you can use someone for free <laughs> for about six months and then you have to do something in order to keep him or her motivated. So usually six months is the limit, and then they become less motivated, so to say. How do you think this can be overcome? Because it can be overcome. What do you do in order to keep your people motivated? Encouragement. Well, you can encourage them, but how? Well, they have a life. So reward. They, hmm? Reward. Reward with reward, but what kind of reward? Because people immediately think about money, but money is not the single thing that you can use as reward. Well, what else? So what do you do? Well, I'll tell you what we do. We send people to conferences. Okay, go ahead. Greg. And you just turned off your microphone. Organizational roles with more responsibility. I, I know that sounds contradictory to someone being tired, but many times we can empower them to do more by giving them more responsibility. That's right. That's right. Or as I said, what we do, we send people to conferences. So whatever money we can chase up from pharmaceutical companies and from European Union funds and whatnot, uh, foundations, we spend that on sending people to conferences um, buying them flights, um, obtaining, obtaining subscriptions to scientific journals, which can be extremely expensive, God knows why, 
Um, so there are other forms of rewards that you can offer to your membership or that you can offer to your activists in order to keep them going and so that you don't just always ask them to do something, but you also offer something in return. Mm, I think all the rest is um, pretty straightforward, but if you have any questions in terms of the structure, then please feel free to ask uh, as, we, as we move on. Or do you have any questions at this stage? Good. So, we also say that science and policy must go hand in hand. It's been a constant struggle, actually, within the ATG as well. It's not a very big group, so we are talking about 120 activists altogether. Um, and as you can imagine, not everybody is active all the time, so they also, well, some of them are on sick leave or just want to do something else, so it's not, it's not you cannot always rely on all the 120 people. And um, there's always a very delicate balance um, that, you, that you have to find between science, scientific work, which requires a lot of time and effort, and policy work, which also requires a lot of time and effort, but in a completely different way. So whenever you plan anything, if, if you want to do anything, um, then in terms of advocacy, then first you have to plan very carefully how much of that is policy, how much of that is or should be science, in order to remain credible, and how you can combine those and how you can balance those so that you know precisely what you want, for which you need data, and you need to analyze those data, and how you can implement what you want to uh, achieve, which is policy. Can so I let's ask, see. Can I ask a question? Yes, yes, go ahead. Um, are, are the people that do policy and science different people in, in, in your group? Partly. Uh, not, not, o not always and not necessarily. Some, uh, there, are, there are overlaps between the two groups, so between the policy working group and, and the community <laughs> advisory board. I participate in both, for example, but uh, that's also because of my role as a member of the board. But there, we do have people who only do policy. For example, we have, um, uh, we have people who, who do some excellent and dedicated work with people who use drugs and they will not be interested in the scientific part of that. They only focus on how to get universal treatment to people, or so to, to disempowered key affected populations like people using drugs, um, which is a huge issue, so they don't have time to do anything else. Or we have people who, who only work in harm reduction. Now, that's a, a, that's a, do you know what harm reduction is? Harm reduction is, is a term used in, uh, in drug policy and harm reduction is when it's, it's not about trying to convince people not to use drugs, but it's about trying to make sure that if people use drugs, then they do it safely. So uh, that they don't get ill and they don't die. So that's more or less harm reduction. So harm reduction is really a cross-cutting issue. It is science and it is policy. And we have some really good people who work in that particular area. So it's difficult to separate, but yes, there are some people who only do this and only do that. So one practical example um, is the, um, or was the European uh, HIV testing week. The HIV testing week, um, uh, the tradition of HIV testing week um, started several years ago uh, in France, in Portugal, and in Spain. And it was, um, it is what it says, it is a week of, um, of uh, voluntary free HIV testing in the country. And then last year, there was an, an initiative uh, coming from Spain and from the EATG and then from the European Parliament to um, extend this initiative to the whole of the European Union. And in fact, we could successfully reach out to all member states and all member states signed up to this. And the European Parliament and the European Commission provided funding in order to buy the test kits and distribute those to the member states and to the, to the uh, NGOs working in these member states who for one week offered free HIV tests to anyone who wanted to come by. Uh, it's pretty obvious right now the trend in HIV is that 
we should get as many people tested as only possible and get them into treatment as early as possible. Because if you are on treatment with HIV and if your viral load is low enough, is undetectable, then you don't infect other people. So in fact, by treating people uh, living with HIV and getting them undetectable, you can stop or very strongly slow down HIV, the spreading of HIV, so you can stop the epidemic. But this means that first you have to get tested because still more than one third of people living with HIV in Europe don't know about their status. So it is essential that you, that you get tested. And it's, uh, it's true for the key affected populations, but it's equally true for the general population that you have to go get tested. So, um, this is a classical example of a community initiative. This came from the community because of this reason that I just explained. Because there is scientific evidence that we could show, we could, we could, uh, we could demonstrate to the, um, to the decision makers, to the political decision makers, that um, science has proven that the more people get into, uh, or the, the more people you can get into the treatment cascade, the more um, uh, people will get undetected and the slower the epidemic becomes. So it was with these scientific arguments, it was very easy to win political decision makers um, uh, for, for our case. And this is how we could get support. And it's not, it really isn't a money issue. I don't know whether you know it, but HIV tests test kits have become really very cheap. It's not, it's not a very expensive technology anymore. It's very widespread, very easy to use. Well, another example, absolutely not so successful, but very noisy, is, um, is the um, Sophos Bouvier, which is, um, the, the trade name is Sovaldi, and it's manufactured by Gilead Sciences. So um, am I allowed to say company names on this stage? Anyway. If there are Spanish people that I'm not allowed to say company names. Anyway, it's um, the, um, I don't know whether you know this, but the biggest killer of people living with HIV is another virus. It's the hepatitis C virus. So most people living with HIV who live with a co-infection of HCV, hepatitis C, will die. These two um, diseases, these two illnesses, work in a synergistic way and ruin your liver. Um, now, Sophos Bouvier from Gilead Sciences is an extremely potent drug. It, it's a treatment of about 80 days, and it can cure you of HCV. There is a huge number of other treatments out there already which can cure HCV, but Sophos Bouvier is really extremely potent with very few side effects. Guess the price. You may not because you know the price. I told you yesterday night. <laughs> so, do you know what the price of Sophos Bouvier is? Just tell me a price of, of one pill. A hundred thousand dollars a year. It's a hundred thousand dollars a year. Actually, it's one pill is a thousand dollars. It's one. I mean, one thousand dollars for a single pill. That's a joke. <laughs> And you know what happened? Gilead Sciences, in the first two weeks, had double the revenues as what they expected. So they cashed in something like $2 billion in two weeks with Sophos Bouvier. And it's just not fair, because how many people can afford this? I mean, how many healthcare systems can afford this? So you see, again, this is a combination of um, of scientific evidence, we are aware of how good Sophos Bouvier is, but we also know how good other compounds are or can be, or other combinations of compounds that you can take in order to treat people living with HIV and HCV co-infection. And it's also policy, we also know that this is just unfair. This is so far from universal access uh, that, I mean, you cannot get farther. This is just, you know, stellar prices. So what, what our activists um, uh, did is they simply um, obstructed com liver conferences. So they went there and they, you know, these are 
they play dead people there uh, lying because they cannot afford treatment. Uh, while inside, in the room, uh, one of my colleagues, notably our hepatitis C officer, was distributing um, leaflets, uh, putting a leaflet on every single chair in the room, in the auditorium, um, complaining, I mean, about a, with a press release, complaining about the price, how it is unsustainable. Why am I telling this to you? I'm telling this to you because I want to point out and I want to make you aware that sometimes classical activism, demonstrations with banners and stuff, does work. And sometimes you can do it. It is something, it is a tool. So it's not just always sitting around in rooms and talking quietly to each other, but sometimes you just have to be an activist in the, in the old-fashioned sense and just go out there and demonstrate if it really is worth the while and if it really merits such a such an effort. And in this case, we truly, we truly believe that it does merit the effort. So you have to talk to your community. And I will tell you what our priorities are right now, and then I will be curious to hear about your priorities in the CML field. But for us, universal access to prevention, treatment, and care is the priority. And I think it's very understandable, especially in the light of the fact that if you get treatment, then you're no longer infectious. Um, another issue is treatment interruptions, which is very high on our agenda. Because of the economic and financial crisis, many healthcare systems no longer can afford HIV drugs, despite the fact that generic drugs have become very cheap, still um, healthcare systems often cannot afford or, or, or supplies are, don't come timely. And that means that there are treatment interruptions. And very similar to your case, treatment interruptions for people living with HIV can be lethal because resistance develops very quickly uh, if you stop taking your treatment. So therefore, it shouldn't happen. We also advocate very strongly for ethical clinical trials. One of the tools how we do it is that we have an agreement with um, all uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers in the HIV field, but one, um, that they provide their clinical trial protocols to us for review before the trial happens. So we get to look at the trial protocols and we also get to look at the informed consent forms. Have you ever come across an informed consent form yourself? Hands up if you've already seen an informed consent form. Now, keep your hands in the air if you've read it. All the 50 pages. <laughs> so, and our point is that uh, we want to make sure that if there is an informed consent form, then it is something that's understandable for the patient, that it is something that if you read, you really actually understand what is going to happen to you in that given clinical trial. Um, and another very important point there is that you see, we get the clinical trial protocols before the trial, meaning that we get to say if, if there's something wrong, if there's, not, if, if there's something that we disagree with. Can I ask a question about yes. that? How did you achieve that? Because there are thousands of excuses why we shouldn't see the trial protocol or the informed consent document before, before it's finished. It How was, did you achieve that? It was actually at the time, it was a very blessed moment because um, there was this confluence of HIV activism and gay activism in the, in, the, um, in the middle of the 80s. And HIV activists could ride this wave, but also there were a lot of mistakes done by the pharmaceutical companies at the time. Uh, because they were also, to a large extent, guided by stigma and discrimination, and they were not really friendly to the community. So we could use this political pressure. This, this, um, this blessed moment is over now. However, you can use us and other disease areas as an example. You can say that, well, why do you do that then in HIV? Because there's, you know, there's no way back there. It's, it's been there for years. So you can say, OK, why, why? And if you can also demonstrate that you do have sufficient scientific background knowledge, if you can argue 
scientifically, and that's what the community advisory board is there for, then they will have no choice than to give you the, the, the trial protocols. Now, there's also a big, if you, if you like, advantage in the HIV field, and that's market competition. So if, if, uh, if and, and this is going to happen in your field as well, because there will be more and more compounds coming up. So in my case, if I dislike a drug or if I dislike a company manufacturing a drug, I can decide to take something else, which is probably more or less equally effective. Maybe you're not there yet with, with CML. I, I'm, I'm not so familiar with the treatment landscape, but it is going to happen. And, if, and that means that you can exercise pressure uh, on the company simply by saying that, well, okay, so I will tell other patients not to take your drug. And that's the market gone. <laughs> so it is, it is a tool that you, can, that you can use. Maybe not yet, but it is going to happen. Does that answer your question? Good. May, may I ask you if you get the same cooperation from all companies that are producing no. uh, drugs, or is it just by... It's a constant struggle. It's, uh, and it also changes, it actually, it changes from compound to compound, if you like. So there are certain areas where cooperation can be very good, where we can talk very well in terms, uh, for example, about HIV drugs. We have excellent uh, agreements and conversations and exchange of information. And with the very same company, with the very same people, it doesn't work with HCV. It, it re so it's a constant struggle. You always have to be, you, you, we always sit, uh, I mean, on the edge of the chair and just, you know, we have to watch what is, what, what's happening. But no, it's not, it's not, in, it, it will never be a quiet thing. Yes. In the spirit of activism, which company refused to uh, sign in on the clinical trial issue? Abbott. Abbott. Abby. Thank you. It's not, it's not a formal agreement. They just don't give them to us. Have been promising for 15 years, but never did. Hardly ever did, rather. Um, so uh, I already mentioned how important it is for us to, to, uh, to include key affected populations like sex workers, transgender individuals, um, and uh, people who use drugs. Uh, and increasingly, unfortunately, in Europe, uh, men who have sex with men, or the abbreviation is MSM. Once again, we see soaring rates of new, inf of new HIV infections across the population of uh, men having sex with men in Europe, especially young people. Complacency um, is uh, probably the main reason, and very easy access to um, very easy access to uh, to sex. Um, Co-infections like HCV and Tuberculosis would be, would be another very common co-infection for people living with HIV, and pricing issues. And when we talk about pricing, that's policy, of course. So what are your priorities? I would be curious to hear. They sounded, when we did that, uh, that uh, sociodramatic exercise in the, in the beginning, they sounded very similar to our problems. But what are your priorities? What are I your think one, one of the key priorities uh, is uh, accessibility. Mm -hmm. access, access to medication, right. Or access to treatment, rather, because it probably is not just medication, as someone yeah, so said. Monitoring as well. And monitoring as well. Uh, for example, in some countries like Hong Kong, mm -hmm. uh, we are not following the ERN recommendation at all. Mm -hmm. uh, ERN said uh, uh, new, newly diagnosed may f uh, need to do uh, quarterly uh, QPCR or PCR, but we can only do, in, we initially do annual, and then right now, half yearly. Hmm. Okay. What else? Yes. So, so in Canada, our issue is within our social health care system, there's discrimination against cancer patients who are being treated with oral cancer drugs. So if I'm a patient on IV cancer drugs, it will be completely covered in my health care system. But since I'm outside of that with oral cancer drugs, I have to find ways to cover my costly drugs. Why, why, is, why is that? Uh, yeah, that's what we're asking. Why is oh, okay. that? Okay, it doesn't make sense, but it, yeah. not yeah. at all. I, I, we're actually saving the healthcare system money yeah. by being treated at home. Yeah. So that budget hasn't followed us. That sounds very weird, but yeah. Okay. What else are your priorities? 
I would say the priorities are very different depending on regions. So yesterday we had a presentation from the different regions, and in some regions you can access all the drugs, then quality of life, lifelong treatment, adherence, things that you have also raised are quite prevalent in other areas. It's really, it's the, let's say, the issue of unknown of generics mm -hmm. from India or official generics. In some regions, it's pure access to either testing or drugs um, or just available to your certain drugs and not others. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say it's a wide diversity. And I would say, except that it's not a communicable disease, there are many, many, many similarities to yes. your disease. Maybe one, one thing that's different is that we have a rare cancer and probably HIV is a much more widespread thing. Yes. Um, and that's why it's probably there's not so much attention on CML than it is on, on HIV. Well, there's not so much attention on HIV anymore. That's one, of the, that's one of the biggest problems actually that we suffer from, that people have become complacent and, 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 and political decision makers as well, especially with, um, with, uh, with a lot of conservative governments coming in in Europe. Um, it's just not it's just not sexy anymore. So people don't talk about HIV anymore, which is an issue. Tamash, um, can I ask you? Yes. You did mention pricing, but you skipped it uh, quite quickly. Now, we do have a challenges of prices of the new drugs because all the new drugs in, uh, which are being developed are very expensive and even maybe more than the prices you've mentioned for one pill. Yeah. So uh, what did you do? Uh, as a community of patients uh, in the issue of pricing. Were you involved in that or did you do any activities? We do, yes, we do, we do several things. Um, one of the, when, and uh, I, I wanted to come to that um, because I, I wanted to list a couple of concrete examples to what, uh, whatever we could achieve with this work. And one of the achievements that we could uh, do is a comprehensive um, access list or table of all uh, the different compounds, all the different drugs uh, available um, for HIV across our region. So we have this complete table which is updated regularly with the companies, so we require them to submit that to us um, with an indicative price. They sometimes refuse to give the price, but then we try to do some research, some background research with our ministries and you know, sometimes not necessarily in formal, but in informal ways, and try to find out how much the drugs really cost. And then we confront the companies with those differences, for example, so that you have to pay a lot more for the same stuff, you know, e even if it is, it apparently is the same region, but there's a border between, so it's, uh, uh, that's that's what we do. So first, first of all, we have an access table, and on the table we, we list um, which drugs are registered, which are available, and which are reimbursed, and uh, by by the social security system. And also, we try to associate that with with indicative prices that we either get from the companies or we try to find out in in, uh, in different ways, and we just use that information. Not always successful, I must tell. It's, but, I mean, that, that will not stop us from doing it. Um, so actually, I just wanted to provoke you with this, what, what are your pri priorities to think about it? Because when you list your priorities, this also means, <coughs> excuse me, this also means if you choose something, that means that you have to not choose some other things. This sounds very straightforward and very simple, but it can be quite difficult when you get together in a room, 10, 15 people, and everybody will have something else that they consider extremely important, but you have to settle for one thing. And it can be a very painstaking and a very long exercise, so be prepared that it's not going to happen easily. So what is it that you want to achieve? For this, we in the ATG use this so-called smart grid or, or, uh, or approach, which means that whatever you want to achieve should be specific. So you have to describe very concretely what you want to achieve. It should be measurable. This is also very important. So it cannot be questioned whether you achieved it or not. Um, it should be achievable. So even if I say that um, 
We want universal access for everyone living with HIV. It's not achievable over a time span of the next one year. But what can be achievable is that a thousand more people get into, into the treatment cascade in Russia within the next 12 months. So that's a specific, measurable, and achievable objective. It should also be realistic, and it should be time-bound. I think that's pretty straightforward. There's something that's very important, and, and again, we spoke about this yesterday evening very shortly. You should be always familiar with the legislative background in your region uh, or in your country and uh, or in the, in the larger region that is affected. So for, for us, this would be the European Union. So be f familiarize yourself, even if it is sometimes deadly boring, familiarize, familiarize yourself with the, um, with, the, with the legal background. What is it that you are allowed to do? What is it that you can claim legally? Um, and of course, scientific evidence, which I was already speaking about, how extremely important it is that you are educated about your, uh, about your disease. So the next step that we do when we develop an advocacy plan is that we do a so-called power map. We actually literally do it on a flip chart paper. paper. So we take color felt, pe felt pens and we just draw a power map. And the power map includes the target audience, so who do you want to reach, who are the interested stakeholders, what are your relationships with these stakeholders. Preferably you should just use, you know, uh, bigger and smaller ar uh, arrows to show how, I mean, how this relationship uh, is. Um, uh, is it reciprocal or is it just that you want something from that particular stakeholder? Um, you list all your allies and also your adversaries. So you should also be aware of who is against you and who is against that particular objective that you want to achieve. So you should be, um, uh, you should engage, of course, your, uh, your allies and you should also engage neutral partners as much as possible. Try to be proactive, so try to communicate upfront in advance in order to try to convince those who can be for you or those who are neutral. And also anticipate opposition and anticipate pushback. So it's not gonna be like, you know, a smooth sail, but you have to be prepared for, for problems and for pushback from any stakeholder. Now, the next point that is very important and I believe that the presentations will be distributed anyway, so you, you, will, you will have this list, um, is that you, that you plan communication. And this is something that we already spoke about shortly in one of the previous presentations, um, that you try to, first of all, inform uh, the audience that you want to reach, try to persuade them, so make a compelling argument why you are right and why you're doing what you're doing, Try to motivate them to participate in what, whatever your efforts are and call them to action so that they join you and you do it together. If you follow these four simple steps or these four simple points, that already is the framework for your press release. So thereby, you can already start communicating. It doesn't have to be long. It's just one sentence or a, a short paragraph for each of those. Um, and always try to show leadership because you know best. You are the ones who want to do something. So it's not that you look up to someone else who should lead the pack, but you lead the pack. Because you are the patients, you live with the disease, you work for your fellow patients, and you take lead. Um, also, you have to be always very specific and very clear about differences. So you can say, or we can say, for example, we had this, um, we had this issue with um, the health commissioner from Malta, uh, the new health commissioner uh, in the now outgoing European Commission, um, who's, um, well, conservative is, um, is really a very mild word to describe his stance. And um, he was not really pro-HIV work or, or gays, MSM. This was, you know, completely off the agenda. 
and we could communicate very clearly that, all right, we don't believe in, we, so we don't believe in the same things. We have, we have opposing opinions about this particular point, but there is something that we can agree upon, which is that HIV is a public health issue. So let's focus on that and disregard our differences, but this means that you have to be very specific and very clear that you do have differences with other stakeholders. Yet, there are also common points that you should focus on. Try to formalize your partnership agreements to the extent possible. That's always a very good advocacy tool if you have a formal agreement that you can, that you can use and rely on. Have a coordinator, it's not going to happen by itself. It's not like we decide it's a good idea, you make it. But there, sh there should be someone who coordinates the process. So it's a, it's a formal decision that needs to be taken. And uh, if it doesn't happen internally in your organization, if you don't have the resources, then try to plan with the involvement of an external mediator or an, an, an external coordinator, which may often help to diffuse um, differences within your organization as well. So it is, uh, you know, as we psychologists say, the sign of adulthood is when you learn how to ask for help. So that's not a shame to ask for help, on the contrary. It, it, it shows that you recognize your boundaries and you ask for help, and then you invite an external person to, you know, lead a particular project because you're stuck. Um, this grid will also be part of the presentation that you get. So you see, it starts with data collection. So it starts with the evidence. Collect the evidence for, for whatever you want to achieve, for the point that you want to make, and then you go through this, these particular steps. What is the issue? What are your objectives? What is your target audience? How do you develop a message for them? What, what would it be? How will you communicate that message to the people uh, or your, to, your, to your target audience? Who are your supporters? How can you build support uh, around your case? Fundraising is extremely important and then implementation. And never forget monitoring and evaluation. People are always, you know, because monitoring and evaluation is what you can show to your sponsors. That's what you can show to the funders. That's what you can show to the community. That's when you describe your results. That's when you um, write reports and disseminate reports in conferences and then look at the impact of what, what you did. So that's, um, that's extremely important. And because everybody gets tired by the end, so that often falls under the table, but it shouldn't. So um, there are various advocacy tools that you can that you can uh, that you can choose. You see, this is about um, the channel of communication and how you can uh, how you can achieve what you want. You can just sit down with your with your target um, and and just have quiet talks. You can write letters. I, I mean, this is really not rocket science. But if there, do you have any questions um, about about this? Because this really is very simple, so I just I just go on, and then we have time for questions as well. Okay. And can, can I ask one, one yes. thing in your in your work? If you look at the last list, what is the weighing of what EATG does? So what what proportion do you do in quiet talks, and what proportion you do in public campaigns? So what where do you guide most of your resources on? Honestly, we do all of these. We really do. We have. Um, this is why we have, the, for example, the policy officer who does t quiet talks every day. I mean, she would go, she would visit the European Parliament, not now because the elections are coming up now, so it's, it's dead, but um, she would go to the Parliament like twice a week and talk to members of Parliament. Um, in terms of the letter, we just, we just wrote a letter in, in this Sophos Bouvier case, um, so that's something that we use very actively. Um, we do, I mean, in terms of proportions, it's very hard to say. I don't, I cannot, I cannot give you a percentage. But these are, these are things that we do on a regular, I mean, really every day on a regular basis. Well, let me ask the question in a different way. Um, 
is it an escalation path? So you say you first try to do to, uh, quiet talks, yes. but it doesn't work, then you go uh, in, in direction of campaign and press release? Is yes. that a usual pathway? Yes, 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 yeah. Sorry if I didn't get your question right, but yes. So this is, uh, this would be more or less how you escalate, yeah. Money, never forget about <laughs> money. It's, even if it looks like it doesn't cost anything, it will. So always plan well ahead. Because uh, even if you just say that, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna just manage this Facebook page and that, you know, we were already talking about this. After, I mean, managing a Facebook page becomes such a pain in the ass, I'm sorry, after like two or three weeks, that sooner or later you will have to think about paying someone for doing that. So even if it looks like it's free, it will most probably cost money. So always, always plan. And once again, try to be very careful with your funding mix. So with your, with your, with your, with your funding, try to diversify as much as possible. It's your vital interest because if your funding is diversified, that means that nobody can really intervene or interfere with what you do because they cannot say that, okay, we close the tap and because you don't, we don't like what you do. So that's not, and that shouldn't happen. Um, yes, monitoring and evaluation, we were talking about that. Um, communication of outcomes, that's your, that's your capital for the future because that shows that you are, you know, you are the leaders of the pack, you are top of the game because you, you can tell to people what you did and then they will be convinced and will join your case. Um, we already, we, we, we already spoke about this. So this is more or less the grid that we, that we, would, uh, that we would use. These are the questions that we would seek um, an answer for when developing an advocacy strategy for whatever, whatever case uh, we would use. So I think that if you just want to um, structure your thinking around the project or around advocacy, then this is something that I would, I would recommend. And this is my last slide with my lovely colleagues who, who contributed to writing the um, advocacy manual, which is the longer link. But if you just go to the EATG website, then you can find it because it's, um, it's an impossible link, I realize. Um, the advocacy manual describes in detail what I was talking about now. And my paper in the Sociological Journal of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences is uh, about the development and the working models of EATG and the European Community Advisory Board as well. Now, if you have any questions, then I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Sorry, I'd like to make a comment. Um, I think that establishing priorities is so important and I agree with Jan. I think that it depends on the region. Each region has its priorities, and even worse. Uh, in Brazil, for example, we have priorities for CML, and we have priorities only in my organization for lymphoma and from, for CML and from myeloma and from a lot of other diseases that we focus on. And there are a lot of other organizations in Brazil. So we have the HIV group and the breast cancer group so there are a lot of priorities and we just have one health minister and everybody's taking their priorities to the health minister and this gives him the right to say, ah, there are so many things to look at and we have so many few resources that I will study where is the best uh, place that I can put the resources and I will get back to you. And he never does. So. Uh, what we are trying to do different this year is uh, join all of these organizations, the health organizations, because we have some big priorities for health that it doesn't matter what kind of patient you are, but you will need something that is common to everyone. So what we are trying to do is create one priority or two or three, but everyone together, the same priority, so we can all fight for the same things and engage the population for the same things concerning health. And I think that maybe this will be easier, at least in Brazil, for us to conquer some of the things that we are trying to. 
Well, you're very right. It's a competition. There is a competition out there, yes. And everybody will have a compelling argument why their field is the most important. So build your case. Thomas, uh, I have a question and yes. also is an observation. Uh, once, uh, one thing you, you, in your slide said uh, uh, one key uh, tools or, or, or for empowerment or, or for the advocacy is information. Information is key. But uh, my observation is that uh, they, the information is not really or open openly accessible sometimes. For example, uh, in last year's uh, CML Horizon, I heard uh, Jan's presentation on generic. And uh, I jumped to the good news, almost hurting my head, bumping into the ceiling, that uh, um, since uh, May 2013, uh, 10 EU countries, and uh, including uh, also Canada, uh, the generic the market is open to generic drugs, mm -hmm. so uh, I'm thinking of helping uh, maybe uh, my fellow patients uh, in the ho at home to get access to these uh, more affordable generics. But when I return home, my enthusiasm dies very soon because I through all the, all the search engines and internet, I cannot find the patent information for what are the 10 EU countries and uh, what are the other uh, 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 time frame for rolling out mm -hmm. uh, the generics. So it's virtually nothing there apart from some uh, one to two patents like uh, in the US or in the UK or Canada. So um, I think somehow the information is being held up by the pharma companies. So um, how would you address this? Well, we rely, in this case, we, we rely a lot on, on, um, on these informal sources, even if informal sources are informal. Um, what we do is that we try to follow up on them. So we will write to the pharmaceutical company, and then we will write to them again and again and again. We are in a lucky position because we have these established contacts for many years. But, of course, they also came about over a certain period of time, and we never stopped doing it. So it's very important that you just don't give up, and you ask again and again and again, and then sooner or later, if they don't respond, then press release about it. And then they will have to respond. So just write a press release and say that there is anecdotal evidence about this and that drug available in the, this and that country. Is it true or not? So escalate, because sometimes, as I said, there's no other choice than old-fashioned activism. Yes, escalate to home, because the, the, the government is, is so, uh, they can say this uh, intellectual property is, uh, is um, uh, maybe even uh, considered as commercial secret. So <laughs> but at least there is a conversation happening around the topic, and that will, over time, loosen these ties and open the doors. So you should not, there's one very important th thing, you should, you should never start this by saying this won't happen anyway. But you should say that, okay, even if it's just, even if I cannot achieve what I want to achieve, I will achieve a slight portion of that and then, and then we can move on from there. At least the conversation will start and then there will be, you know, some opportunities coming up later, but just saying that, well, they won't answer anyway, that, was, that is not going to move things forward. So I'm very, I'm very pragmatic in this regard, and sometimes I'm also foolhardy, but, it's, uh, but it has worked. Thank you. Mm -hmm. can, can I ask you a last question? Because you were saying uh, the EATG has, I don't know, members in 40-something, 50-something countries. And you laid out how you built the strategy and how you, let's say, choose the tools of how you follow that. How do you get to the point to that people do things? Because I assume that your activists are also engaged on the national level. They do things in local organizations. How do you, as a, as a European AIDS treatment group, then find people that actually picked it up and really do something and implement? How do you do that? It's a, it's a two-way thing. First. Um, which is the easier solution is that they approach us. So because then there are people who want to do it and then we, we try to help by, by providing information, resources, support from the outside. Uh, we were shortly talking about this 
um, um, yesterday or today, I don't remember, that you know, if, if it doesn't happen from inside the country, then there's still this possibility to, to exert pressure from, from outside and to come in as a foreign, as, as an international organization and to help activists on the ground. So in this case, we would simply go there. And for example, what we, what we did uh, in case of Russia, but we, it's, uh, it's become a little tricky now with the, with the um, anti-homosexuality um, laws. But what we did in Russia was when there were treatment interruptions and when there were um, uh, issues around access to treatment for people living with HIV, uh, then we organized our policy group meeting in St. Petersburg and we heavily press released around it. So we, we simply put the entire meeting, which we would have had anyway, we simply relocated the whole thing to St. Petersburg and we press released the hell out of it. And uh, we invited people, it didn't matter that they didn't come, whatever, so we press released about them not coming. And, um, and we, you know, we were all over the place. And we, we, we tried to support local organizations through our presence. We did the same thing in Latvia as well, where, where there are huge issues. One of the highest prevalence of, uh, of HIV is in Latvia. So we went there and we had a meeting specifically because of this reason there for three days. We regularly go to Romania, again a country with a huge HIV problem. Um, uh, we hold trainings, um, Ukraine as well. We, we had several training courses in, in, uh, in the Ukraine. So we, we, we physically, practically go there and try to, you know, through our presence, uh, try to help the local community.